Hi there, uh, my name is uh, Nicolas Partoulier and uh, I'm here to just uh, do um, a talk for uh, TGDC 2022 uh, and uh, I'm very honored being here. Uh, it's, um, it's interesting uh, during the pandemic to do a full camera setup at home and trying to just like do my best to be in the best light possible and uh, being able to just check with you all about um, what I've done in the, in the industry these last years uh, what I'm about to do and uh, everything that has to do with the creative process of art direction through games and uh, AAA titles through all the years I've been into the game industry basically. Uh, I called uh, this talk uh, Art Direction Through Time because I wanted to talk about the identity of projects as, as well as the continuity and that for a very specific reason because I, I actually worked in uh, in the video games uh, in video game industry for quite a few years but specifically for close to 14 years on uh, the Halo franchise at Devo 3 Industries uh, at Microsoft. And basically as a, as a result, I've been able to just like be here as an observer and see everything that has been done, uh, the successes, the, uh, the challenges, the failures too, everything that had to do with the single franchise that uh, is just going to be like, uh, you know, uh, organically changing through the years. So it's been, a, it's been a hell of a time, it's been kind of amazing. But I wanted to just like share a bit of you know snippets of my experience through all these years. Um, let's just uh, jump in. Um, first of all, the agenda, if I might say, there's going to be uh, you know by part one introduction, part two, uh, the 13 years on Halo, the challenge of long-term consistency, part three, coherence in our direction, the tools to get there, and part four, our direction never comes first, which is a bit of a motto phrase that I keep in mind. Uh, and uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, I can just like properly embed our direction in what it needs to be for any project, which is uh, never not enough and never too much either. And, uh, and all these, all these uh, philosophies when it comes to the creative input in a team, it needs to actually have a proper place and a proper, uh, you know, mindset. Um, let's just jump in. Part one, introduction. This is the easy part and this is where I basically show uh, art, you know. Uh, Obviously, I I just uh, I like chatting about anything that has to do with art direction. But even better, I like showing uh, imagery and uh, imagery that has been going on and that I've done during all these years. Um, uh, let's just start with uh, you know all the projects I actually just like fought for. Uh, I started in industry uh, at a, you know bit 1990s around like probably like 1996, 1997. I initially come from two years of the multimedia industry, which is ironically the term that was used at the, at the time, which was a bit of a pre-internet era in which uh, people who, who, would have, who would actually have CD-ROMs in their living room. And uh, there were a few very early projects that were basically and, and, and like loosely touching on games, but mostly like interactive multimedia products. Uh, I kind of really, uh, you know, um, uh, helped a bit when it comes to the, that universe, but as soon as 1997, I went straight into games, and I have been into games ever since. Uh, the first uh, company I worked for was Dark Rock Studio, and we released uh, Alone in the Dark 4 back in 2001. Uh, I think we uh, actually sold at that time 1.2 million copies, which was already, already pretty phenomenal for uh, a French game at that time. So I could even say that as soon as in that period, I was already jumping into the what we you know call the triple a industry which is basically bigger budgets bigger offering when it comes to games compared to uh you know indie projects obviously uh and as a result i went straight into that being able to uh you know uh, work a lot with uh, different teams being able to embed, admit, embed myself into all the needs that were needed for uh you know all the um uh, like uh, like if, if anything that had to do with all these bigger projects basically uh, 2003, 2004, I jumped to uh, Ubisoft in Montreal uh, with uh, Prince of Persia Way Within, which was, uh, you know, the follower uh, project, the following project after Sands of Time. Uh, Cold Fear started in Paris, like in 2003, around there, 2004, uh, but it f actually finished in Montreal back at that time. Uh, and obviously around 2004, I actually um, worked on, uh, you know, the very, very early concepts of uh, Assassin's Creed. So it was... A, a huge, you know, a chance and, 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 and excitement to be able to work on something that became so big and that became just so prevailing into the uh, video game industry. Uh, worked on Rage uh, from uh, 2005 to 2008, basically, uh, at its software uh, in Texas. And after that, 
uh, I actually uh, joined uh, Microsoft uh, to actually build everything that you have in front of you right there, which is, which are like uh, projects, games, three games, uh, Halo uh, 4, Halo 5, and Halo Infinite that was actually released last year. But also, uh, since uh, T43 was actually built as a franchise studio, a lot of different uh, uh, initiatives connected to uh, CP products, like consumer products, uh, uh, like book covers, uh, comic books, toys, anything that had to do with the series, uh, like putting my contribution wherever it was uh, required and necessary and needed, uh, and very excited to do so through a lot of different uh, projects, sub-projects, initiatives, uh, and again, that implies a, a lot of art, obviously, and uh, all the stuff I love. Uh, to, uh, on a small note, I really just, I, I was actually very passionate about the marathon days back as soon as 1994. So I really kind of went into the, uh, very early on into into the uh, the ancestor of what Halo uh, was going to be becoming afterwards uh, in 2000. So it's, it's, a, it's a universe that I've been actually very uh, close to and that actually I, I hold very, very close to my heart for a lot of reasons connected to first person shooters. Uh, connected to the early addiction of actually, you know, uh, uh, the process of uh, just having online battles through first-person shooters. It's just something that was uh, so phenomenal back in the days. And now reaching 50, I'm still all, always very excited about it. And this is just all my history when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, Halo, but also uh, Doom, uh, Quake, uh, and a lot of different uh, first-person shooter games. Uh, here again, a panel of everything uh, from the art books to uh, the Halo Infinite cover to um, the Halo Encyclopedia, the Warfleet book, uh, like novel covers, a lot to cover basically. And, uh, and this has a lot to do with uh, everything I've been uh, contributing to through the years. Uh, but it's not all. I've had uh, also uh, a lot of uh, different projects and and I've been very excited to actually participate to a lot of different book covers, for example. I've done like many, many book covers through the years. On books, I've had uh, the honor to uh, actually contribute to, uh, to contribute to a lot of introduction for books published by friends, published by people I admire, and, uh, and, and, and with which I really had a lot of re reciprocal uh, you know, help and, and a lot of ideas being shared. So basically, uh, I've been able to um, just like express myself and help as much as I've received also a lot of help from peers, colleagues, friends that, that have been like helping me and I've been helping them into the video game industry. It's been a, a hell of a ride, if I might say, and it's been really pretty phenomenal. Uh, art, I'm going to put the art right now because again, you know, I do have quite a few slides that are connected to, connected to a bit more text. So uh, to give you a bit of a glimpse of everything I've, I've been doing, uh, you know, People tell me that I have a very specific style. Uh, at the same time, I like being able to be versatile into uh, some of the techniques that I've been using through the years. And obviously, a lot of line work, as you can see on the left side, a lot of rendering on the on the right side. I've never been uh, like a, a, a huge user of 3D assets, but that's also because I always feel that there's always better and more talented colleagues that can uh, that get, that can do that. So most of the time, I try to stay into my area of expertise. Now that being said, I've been working in 3D and 2D and 2D all my life uh, when it comes to pure art direction. Obviously, because making a game is just not about uh, making concept art. It's about the following through from concept art to the you know the the, the final feel uh, of of a game and everything that has to do with all that and all that process and all that pipeline basically. More art, again, line work, as you can see here. Uh, I'm a fanatic of spaceships, as you may know. It's uh, These are just like things that I'm addicted to. So any type of shape, I think these, the, it, there's just a bit of an infinite way of creating uh, shapes and forms that are connected to uh, to all that. And I've been trying to express myself, myself into it for all, from, you know, for all these years. Um, rendering, uh, again, you know, here, and you know, it can just, I, I loved I love viewing into fantasy as much as going into science fiction. Both intertwined. There's projects that are actually very Jack Vance looking, for example, and that will actually just like have a mix of many things that are all the new at the same time, technological, but also uh, very much connected to ancient things and and even like medieval feels and and things that are uh, you know very much from the past, basically. 
I like everything. I just lo love exploring all these universes, and it's been something that have been pushing me, that has been pushing, you know, my 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 excitement during all these years. There's an, another thing that I'm actually that I've always been fascinated with, and this is something that is a huge plus when it comes to video games. Basically, it's uh, literally visual design, the design of things. It's the it's the how do you read the object? Basically, um, what, is, what is the flow of your object? It's, it's literally uh, like a, a very specific um, area of, of, of conception that is connected to uh, shape language, uh, but also connected to colors. Um, you know, basically, visual design is fully embedded into illustration and into image making. And, uh, and all, the, all these design bits is just something that, again, I've been like, focused on for so many years. Uh, the little anecdote when it comes to making spaceships on that sheet as much as making weapons on that sheet on the left side. On, in, in the Halo law, it's true that there's been a lot of spaceships and weapons, and there's a lot of spaceships that actually look like weapons, and a lot of weapons that actually look like spaceships. So basically, uh, you know, like killing two birds with one stone, uh, basically, we would always just do one and the other at the same time, and we had a, a lot of fun doing so. Uh, I'm still going to put a bit more art out there because, again, as I was telling you, there'll be more like uh, uh, sheets, you know, like slides that are going to be empty of art. So I want to just like pack a punch on the art right now. Again, book uh, covers, novels, um, a, a lot of different fields for when it comes to all that stuff, basically. Uh, I get the question a lot, and I'm just going to click on my slide here. I get this question a lot when it comes to my name and why is. Uh, basically, why did I take uh, a nickname? You know, a lot of people are just like asking why. Well, it's true. Apart from the fact that as an artist, it's good to just have a bit of a one syllable name in which you you can just like instantly connect. It's easier to just remember. <laughs> There's a bit of a little story when it comes to my own name. What I mean is that uh, when I was uh, you know a teenager in France, uh, back living in Paris, my uh, father would actually just like come back home and he would actually uh, go to the bookstore and bring me specific books. And these books were actually written by um, a Swiss writer who died a few years ago called uh, Nicolas Bouvier. He had this, I had the same name as he, he, he had. And as a result, uh, my dad would just come back home and say, hey, Nick, look at that. You actually uh, uh, you know, wrote another book. Congrats. And it was very funny uh, the first several times, but I think he actually put, like, bought like three different books from me on, at the, on that front. And as a result, it becomes kind of mildly infuriating, actually, having your own dad being able to just like give you books that you never wrote, even though you have your name on it. Uh, jokes aside, it's true that as a result, it kind of really just taught me straight away that maybe I needed to find my own vibe when it comes to an odd name. And so why I actually just took Spoth. And Spoth is really just connected to, you know, the... Um, the Spartan attitude to walking a lot, to be, I would say, a former workaholic. What I mean by this is that I used to just not really have a fine balance between work and, you know, personal life. I tried to just be way more balanced on, on that front. And as a result, I think I become and I became a better artist by being able to just separate better, you know, my work, uh, my working life uh, and my personal life. Uh, and uh, I think that it needs to be done to be able to fully focus and be very uh, much connected to what you do. Uh, that dedication, I think, described me best. Also, Spoth is just like the first four letters of author of my, uh, you know, first uh, first kid, who actually is named as, uh, Arthur. And as a result, it was a bit of an homage to uh, to uh, my, my my first kid, basically. So now now you know everything about Spoth, about the name I choose. It is just the name. It's it's uh, it's pretty simple, but I mean I. I, I'm very happy having chosen that nick, basically. Uh, what do we do in in uh, video games when it comes to uh, uh, you know concept art? Uh, this is actually nowadays pretty straightforward. Uh, concept art uh, has become a main discipline into uh, video games. It, it, these are the main providers and helpers when it comes to a lot of initial prototyping art content. You know, how do you just like uh, organize a pre-production phase without concept is just not feasible. Uh, you need to actually be supplied with as much imagery as possible to just like make sure you have a game that just makes sense. Uh, and so uh, this is what I've been doing. Uh, I really believe, and so why I'm just writing that in my slide, that um, 
there's a bit of a magic that resides in everyone's brains when it comes to being human and being always eager to discover things that are unknown. I think the human spirit and the human mind is actually intricately connected to the process of new worlds, new ideas, uh, new things that are actually just like still unpaved, whether they be physical or virtual. And as a result, I think it, it is vital to just like keep that nature going. Uh, and I've been trying to just like do so. Uh, the main focus also is to just make sure that we train in the real world. What I mean by training is that um, you need to understand the existing world in order to better translate it afterwards into your own imagination. Understanding the world of today is the best way to make sure that you can just like push for the world of tomorrow. Uh, and I think that both are so intricately connected, but uh, not only in terms of philosophy, uh, in terms of history, geography, you need to be uh, really connected to what's happening in the world, but also when it comes to all the art techniques and anything that has to do with, uh, you know, um, the physics of lights, uh, the, the, basically the theory, the theory of colors, understanding the chromatic circle, understanding how to use uh, complementary colors when it comes to uh, compositions. All these things are very intertwined to an intent of understanding and profoundly respecting and, and, and digesting all these ideas that are connected to nowadays worlds uh, and that are just like functioning into what we have in front of our eyes, basically. So obviously, again, create an expand within these principles that I just described and being able to uh, keep also, and this is a bit of a vital feature, keep the, the curiosity going. Uh, the curiosity is the main fuel and the main motor for, uh, you know, discovery. And uh, one goes with with the other and, uh, and, and it's the best way to just like push your curiosity forward, basically. Uh, again, uh, long-term presence on a single franchise. This is what I've done for like uh, more than 30, 13 years. Uh, the capacity to renew yourself and to renew oneself when it comes to such a franchise, it's been pretty phenomenal. I think there's been a lot of wins. Uh, you have, as I'm writing down here, the time to adapt. And this is the great advantage of just working for so long on a franchise. It's the fact that you become not only a participant, but an observer as to what everything is just like, everything is just going around you. Uh, you become also, as a result, a, a better expert you are able to just like leverage your peers. You're, you're able to just like profoundly uh, dig into, the, into the, the, the deeper subjects of the franchise and making sure that it's just going to be looking as, as awesome as it can. Uh, the longevity is something that is kind of phenomenal on the long term. I've been like very thankful and very lucky being able to just like be on that franchise for so long. Not, not only because I've had it close to my heart for so many years, but also because you're able to be a, be a better expert. It's just a sure fact, and I've loved every minute of it. But, and this is, you know, the, the, the big condition, you need to keep your vibe and your energy going. And uh, uh, I remember that when Bonnie Ross actually gave me the, uh, you know, the, the position of uh, trying to just make sure we were gonna have great art direction on Halo 5 and then Halo uh, Infinite, uh, I was really convinced in my head. I was like, I'll do it until my creative juice will probably like just like kind of wane or until a point where I think it will be too much and it will need to just like hand the torch to uh, other contributors on the franchise. And I think that right now this is what happened. And it's why uh, I actually, and this is a bit of an announcement uh, that, I've, that, that I'm doing uh, right now, uh, that I actually departed uh, Microsoft uh, and 343 Industries after uh, so many years in order to uh, join Tencent and to join uh, Team, K Team Kaiju in, um, in Seattle, in Bellevue, exactly. Very excited to do so. Uh, tons of things to discover, to just like jump into when it comes to uh, a new initiative, a new project, new uh, people and colleagues to actually work with. Uh, very excited to do so. I have the Tencent mascot just by, behind me. Um, I could not be happier right now, uh, despite the overwhel overwhelming process of actually having an onboarding that just makes sense through Tencent. Uh, and I'm uh, very happy to uh, actually join. Um, and uh, on that, I'll just go to the next uh, section. So obviously, uh, as I was saying earlier, 13 years on Halo is a long time. And, uh, and it is a fact that um, 
uh, you live through very, very different moments when it comes to uh, that that length of time. There's been wins, there's been crunch time, there's been uh, like uh, failures, there's been amazing successes. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of different friendships. There's been uh, there's been crazy times. There's been party time, uh, and uh, and it's true that um, I'm very thankful being able to just like chat about this uh, for uh, TGDC because basically uh, it's kind of putting for me a bit of a of a finishing touch to uh, a, a very extended period of my life uh, that actually counted a lot through a franchise that also counted a lot for me basically. Uh, I'll just go straight into these different sections because. Um, I try to describe what I've lived through uh, in the best way possible. And uh, the best way to just do this is to kind of imagine like these studio phases that it has nothing to do with anything official. It's more like how I felt about it and how uh, you could just like see a bit of the passage of, of time through these different uh, d d these uh, different phases, basically. The first phase of that of, uh, of the fourth industry uh, from uh, its uh, birth to uh, 2012 and to the release of Halo 4 is uh, is is that long period that I would call uh, you know uh, the find your identity period? Obviously, from outside, you know, there's always uh, a lot of fan feedback that is connected to hey, this project is just not Halo like it used to. This project should just be or on the contrary, just like it should just be looking different. We've had tons of different feedback through the years, and finding a way to still have some some consistency is something that was difficult. But it, there's a sure fact: it's the it's the, the idea that when the studio was created, the initial mandate was not specifically to just be legacy oriented and to respect everything that Halo had done Halo had done in the past through Bungie. It was, hey guys, you need as a new studio, you need to find your own vibe, to find your own identity. And, uh, and it's true that um, it was uh, Kenneth Scott's mandate at that time, who was the art director to just do this. You know, it was just, uh, it was a pretty daunting task, and um, I think uh, Kenneth did uh, some, uh, had some phenomenal results to release a game like Halo 4 that was actually fresh and new, and that was actually presenting like uh, groundbreaking technology. Also, also when it comes to some of the results we had uh, back in 2012, um, and, uh, and and again, this was just a bit of a, a bit of that find your identity curve, I, I might say. We continued in that next phase from 2013 to 2015 into pushing for something that was even more, uh, something kind of, I would say, still very personal. The, I, I call it our, our uh, visual boundaries, you know, pushing these boundaries uh, and that through Halo 5. The thing with Halo 5 is that it was, uh, it was pretty complicated though, because again, you know, um, People expected something that was maybe a bit uh, a bit more intimate, and we actually just like just went straight up into a very co-op experience with like more Spartans and with a lot of very different things that were very crowded when it comes to the campaign. So uh, cons and pros and successes and some failures, but basically Halo Five was really part of that second phase when it comes to the studio, a reinforcement of Phase One. Uh, and uh, and and truly some successes too, and a lot of people actually really just loved Halo 5. But at one point when Halo 5 was actually released, uh, we started to really just have a bit of different type different types of feedback and 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 different types of exhaustion connected to hey, are we on the best roadmap? Are we in on the best road to create a Halo game that people can just recognize as such? And as a result, uh, we needed to just uh, have a bit of a redirection. Uh, you know, I took over our direction in 2014, um, in like in the middle of the project. Uh, Kenneth Scott was actually the art director on Halo 5, and after that, I kind of just pursued in the same uh, in the same shoes to just make sure we would have a great game. Uh, but as a result, you could just not do like a full redirection. And besides, it was just like beside the point. We were already like literally going into a lot of ideas that we felt were really good, and 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 the game actually was really good on a lot of fronts. But uh, uh, when the next game started, as soon as uh, you know the, the pre-production phase in 2015, 2016, uh, this is where it. I just had the full, uh, you know, uh, freedom to just like imagine like a a, a, a new set of um, basically uh, pillars to make sure that we would actually just like have a bit of a reconnection. This is what I call phase three from 2016 and up until 2021, uh, which was. Um, Basically, the release of um, of uh, Halo Infinite, and uh, uh, that phase was the back to legacy phase. Basically, it had to do with 
reconnecting with the roots of Halo, with the foundation of what Halo was, making sure that we would actually have a bit of a longevity thing going on where from uh, you know the very early phases of the franchise to Halo Infinite, we would actually still say, hey, you know what? That franchise is just coherent, it just makes sense. So a little bit of deviations, that's the least we can say when it comes to Halo 5 and Halo 4, for very legitimate, you know, very uh, uh, good reasons that I just explained and that we really connect, that was just connected to some phases of the studio where when things happen, it just makes sense at a moment in time. And after that, you need to do some redirection. And this is what we did on Halo, uh, Halo Infinite, basically. Now, when it comes to you know the challenges of uh, through the years obviously i could just like put a list of like 50 different items so i just wanted to take a few uh the first one uh again it's just chat just one second about the the what i was saying earlier which is a franchise is an organic entity basically games that happen through a franchise process uh, it is organic it is ever-changing different times different games and this is something that is not always easy to understand when it's seen from the outside but internally it really just made a lot of sense because uh the the games are literally the product of all the contributors on a sp on, on on that that are, that are just in the core of uh, of the team and basically you cannot just like literally just like format and and and, and prepare and build and construct like a game uh, like if it's just like uh, pure math, it's a lot of math, but it's a lot of arts. It's also a lot of sensibilities. It's a lot of different choices that are be being just done. And as a result, uh, uh, basically, uh, it really just makes sense to talk about um, something that is organic, that is actually very fluid. And I insist on that fluidity term because that's what a franchise is, basically. Uh, one case, uh, you know, to just talk about was the environment art, for example, you know, uh, We've had on uh, Halo 4 and then Halo 5, a lot of different architecture. And this is something that I was pretty obsessed with back in the days when it comes to how much is too much when it comes to crazy architecture. Uh, the former architecture out of the games, uh, out of the Halo games was an eternal subject of, of really nice and exciting discussions. But uh, at one point we were wondering on Halo 5 if we were, were not just like deviating from the initial mandate. The initial mandate of uh, for the fauna architecture was it needed to be monolithic. It needed to be kind of really pretty religious and like mystical in a very alien type of way. Uh, and we just like pushed the boundaries so much that we just made everything like crazy epic. What happens uh, when you work on a franchise like this and all these games is that you want to make everything bigger. You want to make everything like taller more crazy and basically you want to push the game to the extremes and the problem that comes up is how much epicness is actually killing epicness when is it too much uh, to just like put everything epic because de facto when everything is epic probably nothing is epic anymore and this is and i could actually just expand that issue to a lot of different fields of the game where we needed to just bring back the intimacy uh, and bring back like some close-up versions of storytelling, basically. Uh, and it's just not something we focused on enough on Halo, F Halo 5. We wanted to just like expanding on a lot of different fronts. I think that what happened on uh, Halo Infinite, and, and it's really was, it was a conscious uh, focus and choice. It was the fact of being able to uh, like focus on Master Chief, have had some close-up on Master Chief and being able to just like go back to storytelling that would be intricately connected to the process of uh, you know um, uh, Master Chief and the weapon which is New Cortana if I might say and as a result I think it would just like helped a lot and helped a lot to, to reinstall to storytelling in in the best way possible uh, and again I think that I, I really believe that if you love an IP and this is something that, as an art director that uh, I really felt a lot you know at one point you want to do a lot of things that are kind of you and uh, there's nothing wrong with this to, up until the point where you need to profoundly uh, understand the franchise you're working on and being able to just like say, hey, my contribution might be overwhelming to the foundation of the project. And basically, I believe that if you love a, a very specific IP and that you work as an art director on, a, on an IP, you need to actually like being able to push a bit of your ego away, push, push a bit of the contribution and some of the the ideas that you feel are the strongest and you say, I really want that. Well, you need to make sure that the things you really want are also profoundly connected 
to the foundation of the IP that you have maybe not initially created in the first place and that belongs to a team, a project, a company. And, uh, and as a result, it's, it's something that needs to be done. To better serve an IP, you need to actually kind of really do a lot of letting go and quite some meditation to make sure that what you provide to it is also a profound understanding of what the franchise is and the IP is initially. So I think it's, the, it's just the, the best effort that you can do when it comes to uh, a game, basically. Part three, uh, the coherence uh, in uh, art direction. And uh, I'm gonna start by saying that, uh, obviously when it comes to art direction, I could just like give you like the full, the full extended list of image making and then uh, you know, how do I just contribute to beauty corners and how do the uh, art director actually is going to be inserting himself into all the process to just make sure that the game is just gonna look finished. There's, there's a lot of different phases uh, and it's true that there's always a lot to talk about and I just have that amount of finite time when it comes to explaining the whole thing. Uh, I think that uh, I'll just focus on just uh, quite a few very like general subjects. Uh, the first one is obviously the fact of being able to identify initially uh, the project goals when it comes to any type of games, uh, which are visual, the narrative, the gameplay, how they just like all interconnect into something that is coherent, logical, and that is just serving the purpose, uh, the economic pur purpose of the game, uh, the success of the game, all that is just intertwined. Art direction is just like a very strong uh, building component and, and discipline that is just like intricately connected to game making. Um, and I'll just, you know, talk about this further, but again, you know, I really believe that art direction is just like uh, nothing by itself, basically. Uh, I'll jump on to section number two, which is the uh, the visual pillars for games. Uh, obviously, uh, when we went from Halo 5 to um, uh, Halo Infinite, uh, I needed to fully reimagine the pillars. Pillars are like the, 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 the main structure and the backbone of uh, of what an initial project is going to be, especially when it comes to prototyping phase, sorry, uh, and uh, and uh, and basically a pre-production period. Uh, the visual pillars, for example, on uh, Halo, um, Halo Infinite were very much connected to legacy. It was connected to the fact of having like the proper ratio between science fiction and military, because we felt that on Halo 5, the, the the offering was actually very science fiction, which is great because again, you know, it always ha is, is, is just like pure space opera fighting in space and on, uh, you know, uh, faraway planets. But uh, there was a bit of the military dimension that was really just part of reach and part of the initial Eidos that we still had, but that we kind of just kind of slightly neglected. So I was like, all right, all right, my pillar is to put back like some very heavy military identity when it comes to the almost, when it comes to the outfit, when it comes to the Spartans, when it comes to the weapons. So I actually just make sure that make sure that all weapons were, were going to be veering back into having less color, uh, being less toy-like if necessary, and making sure that they would just be relatable as well as much as a weapon nowadays is going to be, you know, relatable as a, as a military item basically. Uh, this, this, these are the visual pillars, you know, you know, like a redirection of uh, science fiction versus military and how they, they are both intertwined into a single intention. Uh, same when it comes to legacy. And that this was my, the main pillar was legacy, which is profoundly understand the foundations and the roots, the DNA of past games to just better retranslate them into the future. And this is something that I really, really uh, focused on, which is having a personal boot camps, understand exactly what it meant to actually create foreigner structures that would actually just be intricately connected to a legacy intent, whether it be by having a bit of a simplification process. And actually, talking about simplification, this was another one of my pillars, was pure simplification. How do you just like have a bit of an epurated version and process that makes you see the most important and crucial details that are that are becoming the archetype of your game instead of just like clutter with a lot of noise that would actually detract the viewer the and the player to be able to understand what everything is about uh, like uh, about him so art direction is has also a lot to do with clarity and showing an intent that is actually just making sense to the players basically uh, the sum of all parts, and this is another one that is crucial, and that was one of my pillars too. Uh, the sum of all parts has to do with the fact that um, 
any assets into the into games, uh, any type of personal contributions is just like sort of irrelevant. What I mean by this is that uh, uh, nobody really cares uh, about one single asset. Obviously, the maker, the 3D modeler, the environment artist is going to care about everything he's going to be doing or she's going to be doing. But it's true that uh, at the end of the day, what prevails is the cohesion. It's the sum of all parts. It's the it's the final grail. It's really the uh, the sum of all parts. Any assets taken individually are like by nature very irrelevant. It's only in a very beauty corner type of assemblage type of way. This is where you can judge everything. Not only technically speaking, but also uh, when it comes to the full aesthetic and the full intent of what you want to be representing. Obviously, again, you know, uh, it's one of the things when it comes to art direction that has always been complicated. Is just to tell people that um, uh, they can polish and they need to give their best, but without doing too much over polishing. What I mean by over polishing is basically. Uh, the fact of um, of uh, believing that uh, each asset, you just like any asset in the game, you just take a, you know, you just like model a glass, model a chair, model like a vehicle, a tank, a plane, anything, and you're going to be pushing it to the max and basically having way too many parties, way too much uh, surfacing details and texturing. And at the end of the day, when you take that model and you bring it into everything else, then you realize that you do have a lack of cohesion. So again, uh, I think a lot of modelers and a lot of 3D artists and a lot of you know concept artists, we all want to do our best. The problem is we need to make sure that we give exactly what is required out of an art direction intention, and that's and that's pretty complicated. It needs to be told in advance. You need to actually have. Uh, you know, docs that are going to be explaining to you what type of details, what is the amount of details that you need and that is required to make sure that when you assemble everything into a single intent, again, it's just going to be resonating in the best way. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm always giving a bit of that example and it's not to be either snarky or just like not nice. It's the fact that uh, uh, the portfolio online, we all want to show what we do and in games like in even more in games, you know, but uh, that is just like, that needs to be pushed aside. What I mean is that what prevails is is the overall, uh, you know, the, the, the sum of all parts. It's, it's the overall cohesion of your game. You don't want to just like create assets to just say, these assets, they're going to be great on art station and it's the thing that prevails. Well, no, it's not. You want to give your best, but it needs to be intricately to, connected to the project intents. Uh, again, from one project to the next, this has to do with the continuity going from one hater to the next, uh, going from uh, you know any projects that are going to be uh, in episodes. It's true that you want to actually just show that cohesion. Uh, what I did on uh, hater was just making sure that you would have a bit of a cosmetic role for any type of pre-existing assets. What I mean by this is that if an asset, like you take like a grunt, you take a jackal, you take any of the characters in hater, and uh, if you just change them too much because you're, you're going to be basically having the possibility to do so because you can use more powers into the next game or anything. Uh, well, you need to be careful. You need to just make sure that the cosmetics are going to be respected. So the 10% cosmetic rule for existing assets is a bit of a rule that I gave to make sure that I could also uh, like have the consumer product team being able to just do their jobs because basically when you change things drastically and then you need to re-explain everything to uh, the players but also making sure that the, the CP team, the consumer product team is going to be able to uh, ex you know, establish a continuity with all the assets that we have. So the 10% cosmetic, cosmetic rule was a way to make sure that we would just like have continuity through all our assets. And in the same vibe and in the same philosophy here, uh, you know, uh, because of technological upgrades, because of the fact that you would actually, we would just like be switching platforms. So for any type of reasons, uh, it was sometimes a bit of a way to just like, uh, again, have a lot of uh, different uh, asset modification. And I think uh, it should just not be the case again. You know, it should not be an excuse for drastic and unexplained aesthetic changes. Otherwise, you have always, you know, the writers on the franchise like ripping their hair off because they're like, oh my gosh, how are, going, how are we going to be explaining that you have such a change on a specific character, basically. Uh, another thing that is very important from one project to the next is, uh, the, the DNA of what you're doing. What I mean by this is that if you have specific armor, so specific characters or specific offerings or attachment parts on a, on a Spartan or, or, or any, 
any uh, type of um, you know characters and again you just want to make sure that the underlying symbols and the archetypes which is basically the rec rec recognizable elements within the character are going to be prevailing and kept you can just change maybe 40 50 percent depending on uh on the upgrades or anything uh, and again by and making sure that it's going to be narratively explained uh through uh through the game but uh, what prevails is to make sure that the archetypes are going to be respected. The symbols, for example, very specific visor shapes, uh, for example, very specific shoulder pads when it comes to a very s subsets of, of design language, uh, angularity, curves, or any type of things that are going to be part of a specific design language for a specific faction, for example, you need to make sure that uh, this is going to be keeping its identity. And the identity uh, ju just goes through an, an analysis of what the DNA of these shapes are, basically. And uh, obviously, uh, the project consistency, uh, like I was saying earlier, it's a huge help uh, when it comes to consum consumer uh, products. Why? Because again, they can just like in, in, in doing, you know, they don't have to re-explain uh, everything uh, through, uh, through the, the products that they're going to be releasing. And it's why the redirection of Halo Infinite was super helpful from a, from a CP standpoint uh, and, and from a franchise standpoint because it helped the teams to be able to express the continuity that was uh, needed on, on basically the franchise. But uh, fond, uh, art direction uh, never comes first, and uh, this is a bit of a, again, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a bit of a punching phrase, you know, like a, let, let a, bit, a bit of a catching phrase to uh, talk about the fact that I really just never really see art direction as, uh, as, as an end. Uh, basically, I think that art direction has to do with prof profoundly inserting itself into into a full project that really just truly makes sense as a whole. Again, it has to do with the a bit of that sum of all parts philosophy that is just connected to the fact that what prevails is the final product and the proper merging of art direction within all the disciplines to make sure that you do have a coherent offering is what prevails on anything else, on anything, to be honest. Uh, and it's why I just like call it in a bit of a, a very straightforward phrase, the fact that AD never comes first. Uh, but it basically is crucial, obviously. You want to make sure that uh, initially uh, in the production phases, but throughout the project, you want to make sure that you are always going to be pounding and insisting on the best designs and, and on the best visual for any type of art and, and project initiative. But at the same time, you need to just make sure that the positioning of art direction makes sense within a project. You never just want to just step on anybody's toes, basically. Uh, and that's why I'm always saying that, you know, AD, like our direction always merges with uh, creative, narrative and game design directions on day one. And because, you know, we always believe that when it comes to a pre-production phase and prototy prototyping, our direction is just like prevailing. Nothing prevails in our direction. What prevails is the joint intent of, of, of a single team. And I'm always very, very attached to that principle. Um, our direction is just never a self-serving entity. You just don't create art for the sake of art. You create art and you create visuals for games. The game and the fun factor is what prevails. So fun factor, as I'm always saying, is always prevailing on the beautiful. The beautiful is how much the visuals contribute to a game and, and, and to a game experience. But the beautiful features of a game by itself means absolutely nothing. And I'm always insisting on that. Many, many times I've been into uh, all these meetings through the years where, you know, uh, game designs and, and level, uh, you know, elites, they would just like uh, ask the big questions and I would sometimes be the first one saying, yes, but how is it playing and is it fun? And people would be surprised to actually just see me be actually a very, uh, uh, you know, um, gameplay centric art director and to make sure that I'm putting all the visuals uh, to the service of the, the, the fun factor of the game, because that's what prevails. Um, a fun game will always prevail on a beautiful game, no matter what, what, what happens, you know. I would even say that a very ugly game that plays like really great is probably way more important than uh, the opposite, which is just uh, a, a game, you know, uh, that is just like doesn't play very well, but it is the epitome of beautiful. If beautiful is not, is not jointly connected to the best gameplay and the best game experience, then you just have a bit of a fail, and that is just not feasible. 
I think that <clears throat> when it comes to art direction, I'm always saying it's the art of viewing the boat. What I mean by this is that uh, in art direction, it's just not about having a very rigid vision that is actually just like so compartmented and so much put into all these uh, d d these beliefs that everything's just going to go according to plan. The plan uh, can change. The plan is organic itself. That does not mean that you should not be sticking to your beliefs when it comes to visuals. But it's also, you have to take into consideration that on any projects, um, some of these plans are going to be changing. So basically, if a boat is going northeast, you want to make sure that even if it go, sometimes goes north, and if it sometimes goes east, at the end of the day, you want to make sure that the boat is going to veer in the, 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 the approximate, approximate best direction ever. And if it needs to be a bit north and a bit east for a while, it's not an issue from the moment that after that you reunite all forces to make sure that the, the direction is going to be, generally speaking, the one that you want. But you need to be open to some of these changes, basically. And obviously, most and important crucial point is the fact that empathy is key. I started meditating like more than 15 years ago. I think it is something that is prevailing when it comes to being able to be at peace and understand what empathy is. Uh, in a team, there's just nothing more important than being able to leverage your peers into their ideas, provided obviously that you are all having common ideas. That just makes sense. It's it's all a game of just being able to defend the best ideas, but also making sure that you're going to be defending your peers on ideas that you believe are really awesome. It's all a game of participation, a game of balance that is connected to uh, leveraging the right people at the right time to make sure that you're going to be having the best best project at the end of the day. Uh, these are some of the uh, some of the beliefs that I do have in our direction, basically. And uh, you know, uh, it's been already quite quite some time to just you know kind of explain to you uh, everything that has been going on into my brain when it comes to our direction, when it comes to image making. Uh, there's a lot of different facets, you know, that I could have just gone into when it comes to how to create an image. And I don't think it was really the point of that specific talk. I wanted to talk about general subjects that are connected to some of my motto sentences, some of my beliefs in a very general way after so many years on the Symbol franchise. Uh, and when it comes to image making, uh, that, that's, a, that's a very different, uh, you know, entire matter. Uh, but it really has to do with a lot of things connected to composition when it comes to uh, wall of third, when it comes to headroom, when it comes to understanding colors. All that stuff is a world that takes ages to explain and to just like convey through talks, through demos, through step by steps. And I'll be very happy to do some more in the future. Right now, I, I would just love to just like say again that I'm very happy to uh, join Tencent uh, and Team Kaiju specifically when it comes to the next adventure. Uh, I've just said goodbye to Microsoft after uh, many, many years. Very, uh, very happy having done so. I wish them the best and, uh, and uh, I'm very proud to participate to uh, these new adventures. Thank you again uh, for your time. Hoping that it, gives you, it gave you a bit of insight as to how, how, how I walk and how I really just like passion, passionately uh, jump into art direction. It's all its form when it comes to AAA games. Thank you again. And now I wanted to um, give uh, some replies to, you know, uh, some of the questions that have been asked. Uh, where does your inspiration come from when creating sci-fi worlds and how do you integrate your life experience uh, into your artworks? So basically, again, uh, inspiration comes, I believe, from everywhere. What I mean is that we have a tendency to believe that concept art is a discipline that is just like really self-absorbed and that is just like a discipline that could just live outside anything outside, you know, like like the boundaries of life, basically. And that's just not the way it happens. Uh, concept art is just a discipline that integrates everything when it comes to uh, uh, the, world, the world around us, basically, which is uh, literally understanding everything from sports to mechanical questions to flowers to trees to uh, how to woodworking everything is integrated to that global knowledge ID that will just make you the better, the best concept artist. In other words, I really believe that the more you know about the world and, uh, and the better 
the, 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 the value you'll be as a concept artist as, and as, as well as an image maker, basically. If you want to retranslate the best universes, you need to actually just understand the world around you, your surrounding ecosystem, and also learn about, again, new ecosystems and new things all the time. You need to always put your brain at test uh, when it comes to new ideas uh, and, um, and basically new things to learn. Uh, the, you know, brains, brain plasticity is a thing. We are discovering even more than before that uh, the brain is an evolving entity that is never going to stop growing and learning, provided that you give it material through a very strong sense of curiosity through the years. Basically, this is why I have behind me like a full library of books. I love learning and I love actually uh, the theory of, uh, you know, interactive global knowledge, if I might say. The more you learn about subjects, themes and ideas from the world, uh, and the more you see all these correlations and all these similarities that are happening through all these different subjects and subject matters. So basically, my inspiration come, comes from everywhere. Uh, and, uh, and how do I integrate it to, uh, to my artwork? Basically, I really believe that my artwork is... Uh, is my life and it's my life experience basically uh, I love being able to do that correlation uh, a, a bit of an example also when it comes to um, uh, my youth uh, I actually lived in Florida for uh, a year and a half at my uh, uncle and aunt's house uh, in uh, in Cocoa Beach and this was in 1984 1985 uh, during the, the you know the very amazing space era that represented the space shuttle at that time so obviously the context of just like at 14 getting out of a classroom to actually see and just like admire like like the rockets taking off and the space shuttle take off outside the classrooms just right here in front of you was obviously having a huge impact uh when it uh when it comes to my inspiration and my uh, you know, curiosity for anything that is connected to space. We have seen uh, you know, uh, the uh, James, James, uh, James Webb telescope actually just like being launched uh, quite a few months ago and, uh, and now we are seeing the result of this. This is just phenomenal. This is the imagery of the future, like literally, uh, lit literally the future and mostly the past to be honest, but that's what is fascinating about it. Um, it's it's these new ways of uh, of, uh, of finding imagery that will just uh, uh, push you know mankind into territories that are still unknown. Uh, so basically, that's what I believe. Then I'll go to the next question. What do you think makes a good art director? This is a big one. Have you all, have you noticed uh, your art direction changed through different developmental stages of uh, game making? Uh, first of all. Uh, Good art direction is, uh, is a tricky one. For many, many years, I really believed that the best art directors needed to be like cooks themselves. You know, they needed to always be uh, uh, like the best uh, painters and the best, the best concept artists and the best 3D artists. And I think it's a bit more complicated than that. You have art directors that are actually very good and very talented at leveraging their peers when it comes to the people they either manage or that they're actually going to be working with, with. And basically, this is as vital, I believe, suggestion and a good art sense is as important as the fact of making the art yourself. On the contrary, I would even say sometimes it is, it is vital to be able to leverage as much as showing what you can do. Um, proving by the example is great, but being able to actually take what is being done in the best way by peers is as important. So I think uh, the good art director is, I, I think, a good listener. It's a person that is able to just like perceive and see what is really great, what is different. How do you just think outside the box? What is going to be the best groundbreaking idea for a game and something that is going to be fresh and, 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 uh, and not seen already? Because we act in the game industry on a lot of, uh, you know, uh, layers of cliches a lot of a lot of uh, layers of archetypes and and preconceived ideas as to what, uh, like you know all 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 these these uh, visual 
you know materials that are all looking alike in a way so we need to be very careful there's there's a lot of ways to be more more original i don't really have all the recipes for this but uh, i'm also, I'm always trying to my my best to to find ways to be spearheading something that is just like fresh and unseen and and kind of really having a bit of a novelty to it basically and have i noticed my art direction change through different developmental stages of game making i think so i think that uh, again I really profoundly believe that while you can keep like a very strong backbone of art direction through a project, I also believe that you need to adjust to some of the changes, whether they'd be technological, whether they'd be artistic, whether they'd be narrative, whether they'd be connected to a story time that is going to be changing or different beats that you want to be showing. Uh, you need to be very organic. That doesn't mean that you need to just literally lose your style, your personality, and the identity that you show as an art director. It means that you adapt smartly to what is going to be a very evolving experience. I have never seen a game like literally like set in stone principles on day one and respect them exactly and purely until the end. That doesn't, it's just not the way it works. Again, Viewing the boat, as I was saying earlier, is vital and the art of viewing the boat has to do with adapting to a lot of very uh, different ideas that are not going to be the same uh, early on in production and at the end of a project when it comes to all the heavy polishing that's going to be done. And finally, uh, any suggestions, or third questions, any suggestions uh, for a burning art director? Uh, I do have uh, a bit of a suggestion, which is, um, I mean, several suggestions. One is obviously everything that is behind me, which is connected to knowledge, being able to convey new things. You need to just learn about these new things yourself. So I think that you need to eat books as much as you eat ideas to make sure that you can profoundly impact a project. Uh, I do think that there's kind of two keywords that are very straightforward and pretty simple in the way I apply them, but that are very vital. Uh, these two keywords are, ju are jointly working together. They don't work one without the other. And these two words that are really describing a lot of what I do is diplomacy and talent. All talent and diplomacy, they really work together. Uh, talent is, a, is just like very self-explanatory. It has to do with the fact and the process of becoming irreplaceable, at least in one or several fields of, of, uh, of a game development, basically. And as an art director, you need to actually have the crucial ideas you became irreplaceable on things that, and, and people are going to be like wanting to uh, ask you uh, what to do and how to lead in specific subject matters, for example. This has to do with the specific talent, but this has to be in parallel applied to diplomacy as a very strong feature. Uh, diplomacy has to do with the way you embed yourself into a team. It has to do with the way you're, you're going to be participa participating to a team effort, the way you can perceive the strong aspects of individuals that are actually working with you. All these key points connected to a diplomatic mind, if I might say, are vital and are fully intertwined into the idea of sharing and talent. So in order to better leverage people into what they can do, you need to be, actually, I believe, the best uh, a diplomat uh, when it comes to teamwork as well as the irreplaceable artist into your team that will be the go-to person for a specific amount of uh, either matters, subjects, and tasks. Uh, this is what I tr truly believe when it comes to art direction. Thank you very much.